Hi, I'm Monsignor Jamie, and welcome to a brand new episode of Breaking Bread. We have a guest today who's been around Brooklyn a lot longer than I have. He's an icon, and he's involved in church, he's involved in cooking, he's involved in politics, he's involved in everything. So don't go away, it'll be a great show. Hi, welcome back to Breaking Bread, and I'd like to introduce to you today's special guest, Mr. Frank Sedio. Frank, nice how are you? you? Thanks nice for coming. To see you. Thank you for inviting me today. I know you watched the show a long time, and now you finally have the opportunity to be on. I'm looking forward <laughs> to you. I don't look like this by accident. No, I know. A lot of food goes into this, but... Let's begin by telling me, I know you have a long history, you're involved in so much, you know, in, in, in Brooklyn, in the diocese, and Knights of Columbus, the police department, politics and everything. Where were you born? I was born right in Canarsie. Canarsie. My family's been there a hundred years. All right, the end of the L train. That's it. <laughs> All those Sicilians came down from Ridgewood. Okay. They had little homes there and the little paradise. Great neighborhood. I've been there many times, many times. Tell me, um, what do you do now? Well, today I'm uh, I'm an attorney. Right. Okay. I've had a little bit of a different career. I was a police officer for 23 years. Right. I know that. And uh, for 23 years, and you were involved in a lot of uh, historical uh, events. I know when the Pope came the first time, were you were involved. I actually, in... I actually take credit for being the reason why the Pope stopped in Brooklyn in 1979 oh. in his visit. And he stopped where? Right at right at St. James. Saint James. James. There's a plaque there today that's commemorates it. How are you responsible for that? Well, interestingly enough, we found out when the Pope was coming in and the pastor of the parish had told us they're going to pass the church, we found out that he wasn't stopping. He said, that's not acceptable for the Pope not to stop I mean, Brooklyn. the cathedral of the diocese, how could he not stop They there? were gone their way out to Queens, out to Shea Stadium, we said, that's not going to happen. So we managed to put a few tricks in. We put a Polish sign that said, Pope Don Paul, please stop at St. Okay. James Cathedral. And the secret was we narrowed the barriers as the Pope came closer and closer to the church the barriers for the participants got narrower, so the car couldn't go too fast. And then the real wow, secret was, was <laughs> the real secret was putting the first car in the way, a motorcycle car from Brooklyn, in the front of the motorcade and going about three miles an hour with an entire reception before in front of the church. Pope had no choice. He had to stop. The most amazing thing was when he got out of the car, the rain stopped. It was a terribly rainy day. Not a lot of participants, but the church was filled with enormous glee. And it's great. It's one of those untold stories of New York. That's funny because uh, I kind of did the a little similar thing when Pope Francis came and he arrived at Kennedy Airport. There was not supposed to be any ceremony, no greeting. He was going to get off the plane onto the helicopter. So, of course, you know, uh, with a little permission from Bishop DiMarzio, he said, Bishop, I'm going to put in the front row, you know, all children, kids who are sick, you know, some homeless people. Uh, we went to the nursing homes. We put them all in the front row. I think he'll stop. He said, I'll try it. If it works, it works. And sure enough, he got off the plane and he went right towards the people. It was great, but it was well, good. Well, if I'm right, he even let you get in the plane. Oh, of course. Cockpit. Oh, yeah, I got in the cockpit. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I understand that you were involved in the first Caribbean Day Parade. Is that true also? Actually, I ran the first Caribbean Day Parade in 1969. started when a bunch of Caribbean Americans came up to the office and the police department, and nobody wanted to work for Labor Day. And I was 23 years old. They said, let the kid do it. Okay. And today, that's the largest parade in New York City. Over two million people attend it. Wow, that's uh, some history. And then after that, you were a police officer. Then you, you're also a lawyer. So yes. you have your own, your own law firm. You became a judge, right? I was a member of the New York State Assembly for a okay. couple of years. And I was a surrogate judge for a few years. And I retired. You were the head of the Democratic Party of Brooklyn. What does that mean? Well, it's an interesting position. It's kind of like you're in charge of all the Democrats who don't listen to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a lot it's of It's like them. a father who has a lot of kids, and none of them do what you tell them to do. Okay. But uh, for the most part, we've been very successful. We try to bring all of the Democratic Party together. It's not just one group of people. I mean, sometimes the newspapers uh, focus on, quote, a progressive circumstance. We have a lot of common sense Democrats, too. Brooklyn is the largest Democratic we have the most Democratic We're the largest Democratic county officials. in the United States. Okay, so that means we have the most elected officials. We in have the most Democrats. Democrats. 1.6 million Democrats out of 2.9 million people. Okay. 
So a Republican has no chance of uh, getting elected. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you know, like I said, there's those common sense Democrats who sometimes look at what's going on. Okay. So, but for the most part, uh, the uh, Democratic Party is the majority party here in Brooklyn. And when you win the primary in that election, it's kind of to winning the election in November. I know also you were involved in the Knights of Columbus. You're very much involved. Tell us a little bit about the Knights of Columbus. Well, frankly, I, it's my faith and my activity in the Knights of Columbus that I like to think has given me the solid foundation to do some of the things that I'm able to do today. I joined the Knights of Columbus when I was 13 years old as a squire, squire which is a teenage yeah. program. That's I for became, young kids that want to become a, a knight. They're too young, right, so they become a squire. 12 to 18 years old okay. is the group age. And that was in 1959 I joined them. I became the youngest Grand Knight, which is the president of a particular chapter. Right. And at 28 years of age in 1975, I've been the state uh, advocate for the last 25 years, mm -hmm. almost 30 years now, actually. And the advocate is like... Well, the... it's kind of like the parliamentarian for... Okay. Uh, when somebody has a question about either Robert's rules or the rules of the organization, right. I'm usually the person that they come to throughout the state that's wonderful. Uh, and it's a great opportunity. To and I, share. you know, we have a, you know, a lot of mutual friends. I know you for a long time involved in the Knights of Columbus, St. St. Bernard's Council. Yeah, it's a new council. Well, it's about 10 years now. About 10 years. And um, it's a very active young council. And of course, I was at St. Bernard's for a number of years and I was involved from there at Mary Queen of Heaven. And uh, they do a lot of great things. Not only do they support the church and the priest and all our Catholic values, but they do a lot to help different charities. Uh, which is great. And now I'm here at Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and we have the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Knights of Columbus, Sonny Mangone, who was uh, state the deputy, deputy yes. a while ago, but still very much involved. Kenny Layton is the, uh, the, uh, the state, state deputy, state deputy yes. and uh, comes from Brooklyn. And we have a lot of connections, and we also have a lot of mutual friends, you and I, and, and uh, uh, you have been a great support. I met you, I guess, when I first was ordained 23 years ago through the Knights of Columbus, different mutual friends, and then, then going to St. Bernard's and getting to know you. And I want to thank you for all the support that you gave to me in the parishes I've been at, but also the support you give to the church and the Diocese of Brooklyn. Thank I you. know you're very much involved in so many aspects of the diocese and the work of the diocese. I will tell you the real test of your friendship is being able to pronounce your last name. Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they know me as Monsignor Jamie. But uh, that's it. Now, currently, you, you, you live in... Uh, Bergen Beach. Bergen yes. Beach. Bill Basin, Bergen Beach there. And uh, um, you're happily married there. And uh, I've been in St. Bernard's Parish now for 20 years. Okay. I originally came from Our Lady of Miracles Parish. Yes. Silver in Canarsie. And my grandfather was one of the carpenters who actually built that church that exists there today. Wow. As you know, it's a little wooden a little church. A little country church, yeah. yes. And he was one of the founding members of that parish. One uh, of our bishops, Bishop Geppetto, was the pastor there. Yes. And uh, Monsignor Agugia. Yeah. My mother loved Bishop Geppetto. Fish, he, uh, she was... would come over when she was ill and bring her uh, communion. In those days, we didn't have uh, other uh, ministers. ministers. Sure. And he would come literally twice a week and bring her communion. She was very affectionate for him. Okay, and now keeping with the family and traditions and food, you like to cook. Oh. I know you like to eat because we've been out to <laughs> restaurants many times. But uh, I know you like to cook. And I know on the feast of St. Joseph, you have a big feast. Tell us a little bit about oh, that. Oh, sure. That's my favorite holiday. It started many, many years ago when we first opened our law office in Canarsie. And we decided rather than have a holiday party at Christmas time when everybody does, that we do something different. And I, sp I spoke to my partner, Frank Caron, and, right. you know, and we said, let's do St. Joseph's Day. We're both Sicilians. Right. We both uh, appreciate that culture. And we started doing this party. Right. And now, and I call it a party, but it's really a feast Oh, day. I know. I come every year. You know, um, and the tradition of the history of that is that during Lent, for the feast day of St. Joseph, you would break your fast and you put out a big spread. And I have to say, you put out a big spread. Speaking of spreads, I know you like to cook. And we're going to take a break now. And then we'll be back and you can prepare something for us. We're looking forward to doing okay, it. Okay, great. Don't go away. When we get back, Frank Sadio is going to prepare one of his great Italian Sicilian dishes. Don't go away. Welcome back to this episode of Breaking Bread. And we have Brooklyn's own Frank Sadio. And uh, we talked about all the different things that you were involved in in your life in Brooklyn, police, Knights of Columbus, uh, politics and also now food. So you're preparing a 
eggplant parmesan Sicilian style. That's right, and this is my favorite thing to do in the whole world. Every Friday, I cook in my office some of the dish. I know, I've been there many times, and especially on the Feast of St. Joseph. <laughs> and you know, my favorite is that pasta consada that we put together, yeah, that's but it's too long a dish for this, for this uh, segment. Do you want you to tell us what that is? It's so, pasta? Uh, macaroni with sardines. Sardines? It's an old-fashioned Sicilian dish, and what happened with it was, again, the Sicilians, we always hate the poorest of food. We ate right. tripe, we ate their eggplant. Eat, Tripe is the eat. lining of the yeah. stomach, of, right? Of the cow, from right. The cow. So when everybody else didn't eat things, we did. And it, those traditions now, when you're going to restaurants and order those things, they don't. Oh, yeah, polenta, <laughs> right? All those but things. But I am going to break and tell you that nobody makes a pasta cantata like me. You do. And, uh, you have hundreds of people there. I mean, over 500 yeah. at St. Joseph's. And State. then um, also. We'll invite all of you guys next yes, time as well. Maybe we'll do the show there. You so, know. Yeah, we can do that. We'll and have then fun. there's breadcrumbs that you put on top. Fried breadcrumbs. Right, right. Okay. It's been, instead of cheese, it's fried breadcrumbs. Speaking of frying, what are we doing here? Okay, we're doing an eggplant parmesan. So, first thing we got to do is add some egg into a dish. And the idea of it is to be able to um, uh, dip the eggplant into the egg. Okay. And then we just give it a uh, look. Uh, nothing else but egg. That's all you need. Right. No cheese, want, no, no pepper, cheese, no nothing. nothing. Okay. In order to get the eggplant ready, we got to get it ready. A lot of people like eggplant with the skin on. I want to put I, one in these. You have already prepared. That's good. To get the, and get I found that this is the much better way to eat eggplant. And I'm cutting one now. Now you're leaving the skin on, or you're taking it off. I take the skin right. off. Some people like it ready, on. Right. right. It's your preference. Whatever people Sometimes do. Sometimes like. the skin is bitter. And, and the that's thing why is, you I never know when it's going to be bitter. When it's not right. bitter, it tastes good, but when it's bitter, you never know. And this is why a, a safer way to eat it, and I found it to be much tastier. Right. And I have your a, eggplant. So you look at the bottom of it to see if it's, you know, it's kind of like ordering a watermelon. Right. You know, you're tapping on the right. bottom, you're tapping on but the bottom. But I noticed it. Sniff it, and seeds. then you bite. You don't want to get an eggplant with a lot of seeds. That's correct. And, and I don't know. Sometimes they say if it's flat on the bottom, there's no seeds. If the stem goes one way, I think it's a little, you know. I'm stem. not sure what. But I did find that I like this size eggplant right. because it's easy to work with in terms of frying. Right. And it's not elongated, it's not too short or too small. Right. You get more slices And if there's now. someone in the kitchen you don't like, you just throw it at them, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, once the eggplant's peeled, you're going to slice it. Some people use machines, some people... I use a knife and make it nice and simple. You don't want the slices too thick. You want to make them just enough that you're going to enjoy right. them in, 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 in what you're making with that car. And I think that's why some places use the machines, because when that's they're right. making a lot, they want it uniform. Right. The so they want everyone... Have to right. Do that. right. And uh, some people don't have slices, so right. this is just I need the eye. Uh, nothing. See, no, not, there aren't many seeds in there I, at all. I would say I did good. I picked the right ones. Oh yeah. And that's what it looks like. We take this here, and we're going to basically dip it right into the egg, toss it back and forth, make sure there's egg on both sides, and dip it right into breadcrumbs. Any right. kind of breadcrumbs you like. I seasoned like seasoned. Or seasoned. I think seasoned breadcrumbs are much better. For the eggplant, it's, right. uh, it gives it an additional flavor. And of course, what season? Italian season. Parsley, Correct. cheese, right. a little pepper, a little salt. And I put cheese in the seasoned breadcrumbs. I put that in. You add a little extra. Yes. And you want to cover it and make sure it's all covered with breadcrumbs. Okay. And you stick it right into the pan here, and you let it fry up. You don't want it to overcook. Because right. remember, we're going to bake this. We're going to bake this, right. with it. So but also, the, eggplant, it. the one thing about eggplant, you have to make sure it's cooked. Because if That's you eat right. raw eggplant, it could upset your stomach a little and bit. Usually by the time you finish frying it and baking it, there's not much of it. Now, right. what we're going to we be doing here is one? we already made some eggplant to get, in order to make the show move a little bit. Sure. And now we've fried our eggplant. We've got it ready to go. Simple, simple thing to do. Anybody can do it. You can do it at home very quickly. It's a great meal for your family. Next to fried veal cutlets, there's nothing like fried eggplant. Oh, I know. Steak. You're right. Very good. Next, we need sauce. Good. A good marinara sauce. Okay. I made the sauce in advance again in order to save time. Right. But I'll I'm definitely going to take that. Good. I'm going to scoop it in. You know, layer pour the some in on it to make a layer. Okay. All right, and you're going to just make a layer out of it. And so, so you've got to cover it well. And then we're going to turn around. I'll put that over there. Put this down here. Okay, we have some eggplant. And we're going to layer the eggplant. Nice and simple, no big deals. There's no set way of doing it, no direction. Just fill up all the space. So it's almost like making a lasagna. Correct. Similar. In, in a lot of ways it is. And you, you use the larger slices of eggplant if you can, because it does make it easier to cover the bottom of the tray. And you're gonna do this as a layer. Pretty much we have a layer done. Okay. 
going to take some more sauce now. We'll hold that. And we're going to put sauce right on top of it. Now, of course, some people like a lot of sauce. Some people like a little sauce. So, now, you say this is Sicilian style. What makes it Sicilian? We only use Parmesan cheese and only very, Parmesan very little. Cheese. You go into most of the restaurants, you order eggplant Parmesan, you got 3,000 tons of uh, mozzarella on top of it. Here, we use Parmesan cheese. It's very important. That's, that's the real flavor of the cheese. You just put it on like snow. Yeah. Like snow, yeah. I like that. Like you a blizzard. Get pieces of it, too. Oh. Good? Excellent. I'll give you the next one. Oh, fine. okay. <laughs> Put a drop, a drop of mozzarella. Okay. Just enough to get a little sticky. Now, what other, you say Sicilian style? You're Sicilian. Your family comes from Sicily? Yes. Okay, but you were born here. My parents were born here as well. Okay. But it was an interesting circumstance. My grandparents both come from the same town. So we could have been born in Italy. It wouldn't change anything. We would have been the same people. My grandparents both came here together, my grandfathers. My grandmother's father later on. Okay. And my father was born, and my mother was born, and the next thing you know, we were all born, all six of us. So I'm sure you have a lot of uh, traditions in your home. I mean, you grew up Catholic, you and your faith was very important to your family, and any traditions uh, related well, to we your have, faith? Uh, every, up? every family had one person in the family who was the great cook. Right. Mine was my Aunt Josie. Okay. We called her the frying pan queen of Canarsie. The frying pan queen of Canarsie. She Canossi. could cook anything in a frying pan. I used to go to school when I was in junior high school. She'd make me two loaves of bread, one with peppers and eggs, and one with potatoes and eggs. I was the most popular person in the class, <laughs> believe me. It was great. And, I know, um, when I was a kid, you know, we used to bring the eggplant parmesan and, you know, to school, and sometimes the brown bags we used to have, and the olive oil, the oil used to I seep out. Yeah. And they used to laugh at us because, you know, they used to have the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, the bologna sandwich. We have chicken parmesan, we have eggplant parmesan sandwiches, sausage and well, I'll tell you, Bob, <laughs> nobody, nobody laughed at me, I assure you. <laughs> but we had a great time in school because of that. All our kids came from the neighborhood. I told you we came from this one part of Canarsie. Right. So we all went to the same schools. It was really a yeah. true a closely knit community yeah. when I grew up. And there. I tell you, a lot of those communities, you know, Canarsie and, you know, uh, Long Island City, you know, Williamsburg, you know, Park Slope, all of these neighborhoods, the church was the center of the community and the family was the center. So you went to church, you went home, you had dinner with your family, you sat around the table and you ate. That's what this show was all about. That's why we have guests to come on to talk about how we can, you know, bring all those family, faith, and food all together and why it's so important. And I think you, uh, your life you know, as a child and even your life now, you try to do that. You try to bring the community together and uh, we're very blessed to have you, really. Well, again, you're right about the church. In my community, uh, the church was everything. And most of the uh, uh, older immigrants didn't speak English. They made sure their kids learned, but they, but they didn't speak English. And uh, Sunday mornings especially went to nine o'clock mass. They ran over to the de Blasi Bakery and bought the fresh Italian bread out of the oven. Ran home with it to four or five Not the de Blasio, who's our mayor right now. No, no, okay. no, no, no. <laughs> he wasn't a baker. I don't think he knows how to cook anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, brought, I have brought him this dish at, okay. at, at Gracie Mansion. But he knows how twice. to throw things in the fire, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'd run home with that loaf of Italian bread. My aunt would slice it open, put olive oil, put on grating cheese yeah. and black pepper, yeah. and that was breakfast. Oh, yeah. Before we ate the, of we, the meatballs and, and the then maybe you rob the colors. meatball if you get, Always, you get, you get yeah. in trouble. Now normally we would layer this and fill it to the top. Okay, so we're gonna and put we this have in one the already, oven right and here. We'll put this here. Let me open this up. We're gonna cook this for about yes. a half hour. Put it right down in there, and we'll put it on 350. 350 is good, about okay. a half hour. And we'll cook and that just up. Let it sit, and it's um, it'll okay. be ready. We're gonna take a break, so don't go away, and uh, we're gonna taste this when we get back. We're I'll forward. let you know how I like it. I hope so. Don't go away. We're going to come back with Frank Sedia. We're going to taste some of his Sicilian eggplant. Welcome back to this episode of Breaking Bread with Frank Sedia, and he's preparing one of his great uh, Italian dishes, eggplant Sicilian style. Now it's in the oven. Let's pop it out. Should be ready. It's been in there, what, about a half hour or so? Yeah, just about a half hour. Wow, that looks good. 
Okay. Well, let's see how it's so going. The cheese melted. Now, we have the cheese melted. You have a lot of the Parmesan cheese, as you see. Right. And you can cut this up. You can use a fork like this, and then we'll cut it. Now, sometimes when people cut the egg, they either take off layers on top, or you. Yeah, I see you go right on, down. I go right down to the bottom. Okay. And remember, we made this. We layered it with sauce, so everything's equal. So, like I said, in a lot of places, they only put the sauce on top, and this. Right. Is, and they put it on the bottom. Okay. And. Um, the thing that makes this so tasty is the fact that we put so much cheese and sauce in it and very, very little mozzarella, okay. as you can see. All right. You can have the bigger portion. Okay. Is that a hint or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching my out. figure, you know, because I do all these shows, so I have to watch what I eat. Now, we had a really good loaf of Italian bread now. We put it in our nap. I was just going to say. And make a sandwich out of it. No, certain foods you have to eat with certain things. Like yeah. you need ketchup on French fries. All right. right. Eggplant with Italian bread. There's no, no other way. way. To eat it. But I tell you. Uh, next time I'll bring Italian bread. The first thing I tasted was the Parmesan cheese. And you said what makes this different than other Parmesans is that it's the fresh Parmesan cheese, not a lot of mozzarella. Parmesan cheese is a little more expensive. But it's the right cheese but it's for this tastier, dish. But it's and you appreciate the eggplant more. You know, and that's you, the idea. A lot of mozzarella just takes away from the flavor of the eggplant. I hate and to say it. And you can see it. you see the sauce all the way right. through, right? And that's that's what gives it its flavor as well. It makes it juicy. It makes it flavorful. And it's it's something. By the way, the good thing about eggplant, you can eat it for a you can keep it for a couple of days. It's not a problem. I mean, my wife throws everything out after two days. But truth to tell, I hide it because. We could eat it all week. And, and you can, eat, you can eat it meals. cold, you can eat it hot. Yep. And, um, you know, unfortunately, when you go to a lot of pizzerias, they cover the eggplant, the chicken, the veal, tons of mozzarella. Yep. Of course, they're hiding the flavor of what's underneath. When you're cooking something good, eggplant, veal, or chicken, the least amount of cheese you put on, you're tasting the flavors of the meat and then what's so, ever going in there. Not to insult a lot of your, uh, hopefully, your viewers, that's because they do it the Navaladan style. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's no rivalry between the Navaladan, no. the Sicilian, <laughs> the Bares, the Calabres. No. Not you know, at all. In Italy, you know, it's like here, you know, we, we identified ourselves from the parishes we belong. We have our miracles. I'm right. a holy family. I'm a lady Mount Carmel. I'm St. Rita. But Italians, I'm Abruzzese. I'm Calabres. <laughs> and the only good thing is all these Southerners, we stick up, uh, together against the uh, uh, Oh, the North. north. <laughs> you know, therefore they... And they don't know how to eat this. I know. <laughs> well, they say their food's more sophisticated. You know, they use the creams and the butter, mm. you know, like in France, you know. But the Italians, tomato sauce, cheese, and garlic, nothing else matters. That's us. Talking about food, where did you learn how to cook? Well, my aunt was a great cook. I mentioned earlier that right. she, she was really the one I follow and taught, learned from. And... Um, I like to cook, and actually, a funny story, I started cooking uh, like this when I started in the police department. I was working in the 75th precinct in East New York back then, by St. Rita's Parish. Up right, old, the, of the St. Michael's, St. Rita, Michael, right, right. Rita's was up on that end of the world. Right. And um, when we had special events, we had an old, an old fashioned station house, and we had a kitchen down the basement. So anytime we had some kind of an event, sure. I'd go down and I'd make something. I tell you, I think that died out a little bit among yeah, has. the the police. Yes. But I think with the firefighters, they that's still, a whole different story. They still. Was, many a Sunday, I walked down Liberty Avenue, which is called the Station House Post. There was a firehouse there, and I'd be sharing a meal with those guys. Yeah. So I have They're great good respect cooks. for them. They're good cooks. Yeah. Especially I always when say, they ran out and left me with the food. I always say I wanted to have one of the firefighters uh, on the show here to the firehouse to see how that works. And a lot but, of meat and potatoes uh, involved with those guys, but I have to tell you. Another question: How do you find time to do what you do? I mean, you're involved in Knights of Columbus, you're involved in politics, your, your law firm, you know, your church, your parish, you know, your family, you like to cook. All this is time consuming. How do you balance everything out? Well, I always follow the theory an uncle of mine told me, he says, Frank, it's not how long you live, it's how well you live. And that's the way I'd like to live. I do things that I like to do. So it's not work. That's really, it takes a lot of time and it's frustrating sometimes. And I truly enjoy it. Sometimes I kid around and say, I couldn't keep a job. I've had so many different titles. But the truth is, I like what I do. So and the much. key is to like what you do. And when you like what you do, it's not work. 
And That's right. uh, I, I, I find the same thing. People say, how do you do all you do? I say, I enjoy it. You enjoy people, you enjoy what you do, you believe in what you do, you believe in the mission, and you believe in helping people. So it comes uh, natural. And even once in a while, I do some more. That's true. On those rare occasions. Well, you know what they say, you want something do. done? Give it to a busy person. And that's so true. Well, that is the truth. But well, fine. you're you're a pretty busy guy yourself. Uh, I've seen what you do. Right? I try. We're filming Breaking Bread, you know, all the work with the diocese, the fundraising, Catholic Foundation, the Futures in Education, CYO. But Well, I can only say that you do God's work, and that's, I got to believe, what inspires you. Thank you. But we do it because we have people like you. And thank you have you. always been a great supporter of the church and the Diocese of Brooklyn and Queens, so I, I thank you so much. Let's hope we can do it for a lot more years to come. Exactly, exactly. I'll be over to see you soon. And, oh, uh, you know, so you're going to cost Friday. me a donation? No, no, well, on the way out, on the way out. <laughs> but, uh, Frank, thank you so much thank you, for being with us. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for it's everything. Been a lot of fun. On this episode of Breaking Bread, we had Frank Sedio, a person who has been involved in the life and the faith and food of Brooklyn for so many years. And that's the theme of our show, faith, family, and food. And if anyone incorporates all that into his life, not only for himself and his family, but for the larger community that we call Brooklyn and Queens, it's Frank. Because he brings faith, family, and food together. He does it in a very joyful way, and he does it all in the honor and glory for God. God bless you.